Okay, so biosimilars. How many of you have prescribed biosimilar? Okay, I think I see two hands. And then, um, and then, so some of you may even have, uh, you know, may rarely, right, you know, have your um, reference drug switch may, maybe without you knowing. So, um, so biosimilar uh, is uh, essentially uh, to to qualify as a biosimilar, several things has to happen. They have to have the same amino acid sequence. They have to have the same immunogenicity data, and uh, uh, but they actually don't need to be. Um, don't need to be studied in the same population. Um, so uh, in most cases these days, actually, the drug is studied in the RA population, and if it works, then that's extrapolated in, in, in the psoriasis population. So first of all, you're like, wait, that's a problem. Actually, uh, think it's been shown that, uh, you know, even with the reference drug or the originator drug, oftentimes there is batch-to-batch variability because they were all created in living organisms. So even with your, you know, uh, you take any of the originator drugs, um, different batches are actually slightly different. So um, as far as the biosimilars, so the National Psoriasis Foundation put out a, a statement essentially very consistent with the FDA uh, guidance on this too. Um, most biosimilars uh, are, in, in all practical purposes, are pretty much uh, similar slash equivalent in terms of um, uh, efficacy as well as a, a safety profile. Now biosimilars can differ in certain ways. They can differ in the concentration that they come in, they can differ in the uh, device that they come in, and they can also differ in the uh, percent of citrate content right in them. So that when I went why, why citrate is important because it can give the patient a little bit stinging. But um, that aside, pretty much they're very similar. So there are actually nine biosimilars approved in the US for the originator adalimumab, the Humira flavor. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so um, there are, uh, so, so for our practical purposes, they are, uh, they're very similar. Uh, there are biologics, uh, there are biosimilars that's designated also uh, the interchangeable uh, designation. So this is actually, they did do studies where they, um, uh, in the disease population, and they compared with originator and they kind of swap out and then they swap back in and see if any efficacy had changed, and it didn't. Um, interestingly, as just a total side note, uh, as we know, there are some infliximab biosimilars, and uh, one of the studies actually showed the infliximab biosimilars in RA perform better than the originator. Mm. Um, so anyway, in, so in this day and age, uh, I think for our purposes, mainly just to note that they are pretty much, um, pretty much very similar. And yeah. your, your patients may come in and ask about it because they may be getting notifications from a specialty pharmacy or from their insurance saying, hey, we know you've been on this drug for 10 years, but we're gonna provide you this other stuff and you know, because it's um, less expensive for the insurance carrier. So you've got to just have some awareness that that's, your patients are going to be getting that communication and have a little ammunition and an a answer for them when they come in. I've had one or two patients ask about it, but I haven't, that I know of, I haven't had patients, um, have patients been switched yet, but it's, it's coming for all of us. Have either of you had patients switched or insurance asked? Uh, I've had patients switch without insurance asking permission. And I think that will probably be more and more common in the future. To be honest, I, I, I can't remember the last time I started someone on adalimumab. It's, it's probably been eight, nine years since I started someone on it. Um, and I have a few legacy patients. They're still getting it because they're, they're familiar with the, inject, the injecting pen. So they'll know it's something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I don't know if there's been a, a, a deep push to flip them from a cost perspective and things like that, so I don't know. Yeah. Right, right, there, exactly. There hasn't been a deep push because Humira <laughs> is very, very, it's extremely accessible. And then for certain health systems, like I work at the county as well, it's literally pennies, actually, literally. I, I remember when I learned that. You mean the what? difference between the two? 
Uh, no, like the, on certain formularies that, that they negotiate with certain institutions are, are you know, anyway, very, 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 very close so that sometimes it may be economically disadvantaged, disadvantageous to, to, to use a biosimilar, even though the original rationale for biosimilar is for cost-cutting purposes. Um, but the good thing is that they're very similar. So I think that's the main message. Oh, sorry, one other point. Um, if you, if a patient is, uh, you know, has, has an AE2, a, a biologic, um, one of the questions we discussed at the NPF meetings were, were like, you know, would that patient develop also AE to a biosimilar? Um, we say, you know, there's sufficient probability, probably you want to pick a different drug. All right, so this one is, so secukinumab uh, uh, recently had unveiled this UNO-ready pen uh, for self-administration. So for a while, as you may recall, uh, it's, uh, secukinumab is supplied as 150 milligram per one cc. So now there is this um, 300 milligram per uh, two ml, so your patient gets essentially one injection um, with with the second uh, Kinumab Uno Ready pen, and it's um, as you can, it's it's pretty easy to use, um, and uh, I, uh, I I have all sorts of different uh, demo pens in the uh, in in our office, and uh, whenever I have sessions with medical students, I, I demonstrate and, and I pretend I actually got <laughs> shot, and then they go, I'll look very concerned, but <laughs> but I say. <laughs> Just kidding, but but um, because we 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 want, we want to show people, you know, because sometimes you you may be prescribing this, and you may actually, you know, if you don't have samples, you actually may not know what they look like or how to do them. So um, so usually we you know we try to train, especially if people are going to get injections in the office. It's it's good to know they're they're all slightly different, but overall pretty pretty intuitive. Well, the more reason why you need to pick your favorite and, and be good at it because. They keep, the, the pens are all different. The syringes all look a little different. And so you, you just have to know how to explain that to someone or when they bring it in, you don't want to be opening the package insert to say, all right, how do we use this thing, right? All right, pull here <laughs> and jam that in and uh, how'd that work out for us, <laughs> right? So you want to know, because uh, you know we're putting it up here on the Uno Ready pen, but you, you, you need to know that if that's your favorite one. And then I think it's important when you start to see volumes of two milliliters, that's a lot of stuff. And what you want to do, whether it's this and Dupixin is also two milliliters, um, get it out of the fridge for a while. Um, Dupixin can actually stay out for 14 days, you know, in case they just forget it. But um, get it out. I tell patients to put it in their pocket or walk around for an hour and then do it, or at least put it on the counter and let it come to room temperature because you've got to decrease the viscosity as much as possible, and warming it up will do that. Then the spring loading of the pen system will, number one, push it through a little bit quicker, so it'll be over a little bit quicker, but it's also um, probably less painful that way. And it also leaves a lump. Two, two cc's leaves a lump. Afterwards, that's not an injection site reaction. That's just two cc's of juice in your leg or your flank. Mm -hmm. And it just takes a day for it to, to go away. Yeah, this I think, one. David, I, I remember you reeling a story of a person with an EpiPen, right? That, uh, of, of someone not familiar with the. Oh, and they injected their they, thumb. They injected yeah. the, their thumb because they. Wrong they, way they, up. Wrong way. <laughs> right to the so. thumb. A white thumb for a lot of hours. <laughs> yeah, so it's good to familiarize. Yeah, yourself. you want to know what direction. You don't you want to inject it into your thumb when you're right. doing it. This one, it, it does take 22 seconds to inject the two mLs here. And I think one of the things that's important too is that there's two clicks and this, they, the patient has to actually hold this one on their injection site for five seconds past the second yeah. click. So again, these are little nuances that if you don't know ahead of time, <laughs> you don't you tell the patient. Patients are gonna be used to, they hear that second click and they, they think that's the end, so. So familiarize yourself or have your, whoever is teaching your, the patients, make sure they also know. All right, we're gonna jump into a, a case. 
So this is James, he's a 42 year old. He's currently on secukinumab and he's been on that for about two years. He has both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and he was completely clear until about three months ago. Now his BSA is about 10% and he has stubborn plaques on his hands, back and scalp that are unresponsive to high potency topical steroids, reflumolast 0.3 cream to Pinaroff 1.1% cream. His BSA originally was 30%. He's a typical psoriasis patient. He's obese, he smokes, and he's otherwise, his past medical history is unremarkable. He's frustrated by the plaques and he wants to discuss other treatment options. His PSA is well controlled. And he's previously tried and failed phototherapy, adalinumab, etanercept, and ustekinumab. So a couple questions. One, is this a primary or a secondary failure? And then, I want to answer that first. Yeah, what do we think? Is he a primary or secondary failure? Secondary, right, because he had been well controlled for 24 months and then it started to kind of creep back up, although it seems like pretty rap more rapid than I would have imagined. But, um, and then uh, would you consider dose escalation or switching? Right, so that's a, that's a great question, right? So we have, we have a few choices. We could do dose escalate. Um, he is obese, which actually makes me think likely he will resp respond to the dose escalation um, or switching to a different biologic or small molecule. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give my kind of thoughts on this. And um, so his PSA is well controlled on, on uh, segukinumab here. So it's not unreasonable to dose escalate him to see how he does, especially he had responded to segukinumab before. And um, the study I mentioned earlier in the morning actually looked that, at the exact type of patient and noted that if you dose escalated them to maintenance of 300 milligrams every other week, you can get a large increase in delta uh, benefit from, from that. So, um, so if, you, if the insurance approves it, you can probably do so. Let's say if it doesn't approve the dose escalation, then I probably, given his PSA had been well controlled on IL-17 inhibitor, maybe switched him to another IL-17 inhibitor, maybe ixekizumab, for example, in this case. Um, small molecule, I would consider that maybe as an addition if I wanted to, um, to the uh, whichever biologic you ultimately decide. Uh, if, if after observing him on that either escalated dose of secukinumab or a new biologic for a while, if you notice still no improvement, then potentially consider adding the small molecule. Um, so just some of my thoughts in that area. Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I would, uh, I agree. So I would number one, dose escalate straight away. Now that's in a, you know, a glass castle. Right, I've got a refrigerator full of samples. So I'm gonna give him those samples and say, okay, instead of every, every fourth Thursday, you're gonna give yourself um, the injections every other Thursday. So that's the dose escalation, increasing the dose over time. But I'm also then gonna ask my rep to contact my MSL and get me some literature that I can then provide to the insurance companies. So when I see this patient back after a couple months and he's improved on this escalated dose, that when I submit showing um, improvement, decreased body surface area, um, he went from a moderate down to a clear, almost clear, documented in my chart, and I submit some literature that shows that dose escalation is effective and safe, that's gonna hopefully help me get it approved so that he can stay on dose escalation because we can't keep him on samples forever. So the practical component I think is smart. Um, and because the, the psoriatic arthritis is controlled, that's why I would stay in the same, with the exact same drug um, and try escalation as opposed to changing. Yeah, I think the best use of the samples is to, to do dose escalation. It's much harder to argue the point that they've cleared on dose escalation then there's the theory that they'll improve on dose escalation. And, uh, you know, I think when you switch classes and you have good joint control, you do take a higher risk that you might not have the joint control. You know, 
you, you'll hear over time, you'll hear, um, you know, this drug did great for my joints, but not so good on my skin. And then I switched to this other class and my skin cleared, but my joints didn't feel so good. So if, I'm, if he was doing okay, I would dose escalate. It would take a lot to add a small molecule for me. He, we still have a lot of traps to run before I'm gonna add a second drug as opposed to switching. And so you had, I think ICSI would be the, the next one. I don't think there was a contraindication for him to go on bradaliumab if we needed it, right? And bradaliumab's no. dosed every two weeks, so that helps too, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's a very effective drug. It's just got a, you know, a higher bar to get it. You need to, you know, clear that REMS program and be signed up for it. But uh, once that you get past that, it's pretty effective. Agreed. Yeah, and, and Broda, Brodalumab, you know, when you look at these uh, analyses that compare the different biologics, you know, directly or indirectly, consistently comes up as among like the top four biologics. It's always there. I think it's a little underutilized, right, um, due to its um, uh, label uh, and the need for REM program, but you only need to sign up once as a, as a provider and then, then you're basically set, so. And um, access, I think that it, it yes. didn't have the commercial support that we wanted initially and you couldn't use it first line, um, but as a backup, think of that, uh, that, that drug is very uh, effective in this and safe in this patient population.